Um, I just wanted to start, obviously, with the plan that you call transformational, the, the framework that President Biden announced yesterday. House leaders scrapped a vote last night. President Biden arrived in Rome, heading toward G20, heading toward COP26. How big of a blow is it that he comes empty-handed? Well, um, I believe that pretty soon, hopefully next week, Congress will pass both the reconciliation or Build Back Better bill and also the infrastructure package. Um, there seems to be strong support for it in both houses of Congress. As I say, it's transformational, and I believe these will become become law. And they contain so many, um, so many programs that will be so important for the American people. Two additional years of early childhood education that will be universal. R remarkable support that will make child care affordable, help women participate in the labor market, um, it, historic investments in health care for seniors, for the elderly, for those who are disabled, um, support that will make health care affordable, um, and of course, an historic investment in climate change, which is really an existential threat. A and the infrastructure mm -hmm. package, you know, not only has um, investments in roads and bridges, but um, what we need to have a modern, efficient society, broadband, ports, um, modern transport that's efficient and um, climate friendly. Um, investment in research and development in climate change, the grid. You, you have said that this, this, these plans will add to growth and be stimulative for the economy. Any sense of how much and for how long? Well, I, I think that it really it helps us invest in physical capital, that's public infrastructure that's important to productivity growth. Um, there's investment in people or human capital. There's investment in research and development. And the supports that families will uh, receive that will help them participate in the labor market, they'll that will uh, boost labor supply. All of those things boost the economy's potential to grow. Um, T to my mind, certainly over the long run, over a decade, several ten tenths of a percentage point. Will it drive up short-term inflation even more? No, I don't think that these investments will drive up inflation at all. Um, first of all, they're fully paid for. They're, and um, not by imposing higher taxes on anyone earning under $400,000, but by asking corporations, high-income individuals to pay their fair share, and uh, by investing in the Internal Revenue Service so that they can boost compliance, which is fallen to um, low levels. We have a huge amount of uncollected tax revenue, a tax gap that's estimated at $7 trillion over a decade. And the spending that's involved, um, it, it occurs slowly over the course of a decade. So unlike the American Rescue Plan, which was um, attempting to address the impact from the pandemic right. um, and involved a lot of spending in a short time, uh, the, the infrastructure and Build Back Better packages are um, spending that's really small relative to the economy in any year and spread over 10 years. And um, it, as I said, it will boost the economy's potential to grow the economy's supply potential, which tends to push inflation down, not up. And, you know, for many American families experiencing inflation, seeing the prices of uh, gas <clears throat> and other things that they buy rise, yeah. what this package will do is lower some of the most important costs, what they pay for health care, for child care, and it's anti-inflationary in that sense as well. 
you mentioned the pay fors, and I did did want to ask you about that because it, it looks like you didn't get the billionaires' unrealized gains tax, which was somewhat controversial and unprecedented. Didn't do the elimination of stepped up basis, and really avoided the whole tax avoidance by the wealthy in terms of their investments, which is something that I know you were hopeful for and that you promised to do. So is that a disappointment? Well, we, we um, proposed what we thought are good and appropriate tax policies. Um, we do need to be able to muster the votes um, to get these bills through the House uh, and through the Senate. And um, we tried to design a package of revenue raisers that would be acceptable to uh, members of Congress. So we mm -hmm. pared back on some uh, rate increases that weren't acceptable um, to members of the Senate. And I think the, the raisers that we have, though, are appropriate, fair. Um, and while there isn't a mark-to-market billionaire's tax, um, I think it's been agreed that uh, in, in individuals earning um, high incomes, more than 5 or $10 million, um, will pay a, a surtax on their income tax rates. And um, that hits really high-income individuals. Sure. And on the corporate front, I know part of this is, is what you're there to do in Rome in G20 and this, this framework for the, the global ta minimum tax for corporations, something you've worked hard on. You've gotten a ton of agreement, 140 yes. countries, including Ireland, which is a big accomplishment. I'm, I'm just wondering how that tax, when it's implemented, will impact global economic growth. Could it have a dampening effect on foreign direct investment and, and companies expanding overseas because their tax rates are going to go up in a lot of these countries. Well, I don't think it's going to have any meaningful impact on direct investment, um, on investment anywhere around the globe. These are relatively modest uh, increases in taxes. And um, what it will provide is a level playing field globally where mm -hmm. companies and countries can, can compete on the basis of um, their innovative ideas, uh, fundamentals, the quality of workforce and the bu their business environments. And it will provide a, a, an environment of much greater tax certainty than we've had in a very long time. Um, it will do something to close the loopholes um, associated with tax havens that have allowed many multinational corporations, those based in mm -hmm. the United States and elsewhere, to um, avoid paying their fair share. And this is an important agreement because um, countries around the globe have decided that in order to um, finance the uh, public infrastructure investments that they need and to invest in their people and not to have all of the burden of raising taxes uh, fall on workers, that this is a way to make sure that all countries in a fair way can collect more from corporations so they pay yeah. their fair share too. So speaking of multinational corporations, Apple last night reported earnings, said it said it took a $6 billion revenue hit in the quarter because of the supply chain issues and, and projects that that's going to be even worse in this coming quarter. How much do you think these bottlenecks and shortages are holding back our economy? Well, I think they are holding our economy back somewhat. Um, we saw that uh, this quarter with slower growth of GDP. Um, you know, I think GDP growth will pick up, but we do have shortages of semiconductors. The, you know, switch in demand from services to goods and uh, the pandemic itself that led to work from home it really boosted the demand uh, for semiconductors that are embodied in almost all the goods that consumers buy. And um, it will take a while. There is clearly a supply response in train, but it will take a while to boost supply. Although, to some extent, supply shortages um, reflect the pandemic in places like Malaysia. So um, it, it will take a while to boost semiconductor supply, but I do expect um, 
that it will be addressed over the medium term. You just said you expect growth to pick up now toward the end of the year. I'm curious about your forecast for next year, because the Fed is about to start tapering its emergency stimulus and could look ahead toward interest rate hikes next year, at the same time where a lot of that front end loaded fiscal stimulus is wearing off and a lot of the reopening momentum is going to wear off. So what does that add up to for next year? Well, it, it's true that um, some of the fiscal stimulus will um, wear, wear off. There'll be less fiscal stimulus um, next year for sure. But um, households have amassed a lot of saving. Um, wealth has increased. Um, they have stashed away some of the income that they earned and didn't spend during the pandemic. And I expect consumer spending and investment spending to remain quite healthy. And of course, the Federal Reserve is also, you know, while focusing on inflation, wants to achieve full employment. Uh, you know, while GDP has um, now surpassed its pre-pandemic peak, we're still about 5 million jobs below the pre-pandemic level. And while due to retirements, um, labor supply may not go back to its previous level, I think as the pandemic ease, eases mm -hmm. and concerns about health diminish, um, people will go back to work, labor force participation will improve. And, you know, I expect unemployment to fall further and labor force participation to rise, to rise again. Have you stopped using the, the T word, the transitory word, which we don't hear as much from Fed Chair Powell and, and some of the other Fed members? Are you still using it? Well, I, I think it's still fair to use it in the sense that um, even if it doesn't mean a month or two, it means a little bit longer than that. Um, I, I think it conveys that the pressures that we're seeing are related to a unique shock to the economy. And as the United States recovers and as vaccinations proceed globally and the global economic activity revives, that pricing pressures will ease. Monthly inflation rates have already come down considerably from where they were just four or five months ago. And that process is also all is continuing. Um, you know, year over year, inflation rates remain high and will for some time simply because of what's already happened um, in the in the first months of the year. Uh, but monthly rates, I believe, will come down in in the second half of the year. I think we'll see a return to levels close to two percent.